exporting, telling it where to store the information and where to gather inputs from. Uh, and once you set up this for each, it's just this simple line here, this do par that turns it from a normal for loop into a parallel clustered for loop. And changing this line here from do par to do is a good sort of bug check, I would say, if you're trying to get up in parallel computing, because if you leave it as do, then it's just a standard for loop. It won't be trying to run it on any parallel computing, so you can make sure your function works for an individual core before trying to pass it on to parallel. And this big block of text here is just the, the function. So this is the main logic of my simulation model here is taking all the inputs. Uh, and this is the parent function that I was talking about here. So this contains function within function functions to take all these patient characteristics to model patients over time uh, and so on. Um, so, so it's simply just tell for each where the information can be found, do this function in parallel, and you'll get a, a list output. So it's like the map and the apply functions in the sense that it returns a list. Um, another good thing to always remember when you're actually doing parallel computing is when you're actually finished is to close the clusters. Otherwise you will spend hours like I was trying to figure out why errors were appearing and it will be because you're trying to run non-parallel functions in a parallel environment. Um, so that's always good to remember to close the clusters once you're done. And again, that's a list of our simulated patient function uh, outcomes here. But once I switch to R, we'll see those in more detail. I'm just conscious of the time. So, so once, once you've done your simulation, that's it. You, you're basically done with the patient level simulation part. Uh, I always recommend to, again, to condense the results down. So I've just got a function here uh, using map from the, from the per package that goes across each individual patient here and it will pull out the maximum lifetime costs and qualities for each individual patient, calculate the means for those uh, and so on. So, so once you've condensed your results, it saves you having to go back to the original simulation and pulling results over and over and over again uh, whilst trying to plot them. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah it, it makes it much, much quicker in that sense as well. And again, once you've got your results, you can then just treat them like you would with any cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, I use uh, some functions from the what's the DAM pack that's available on GitHub by Genoit um, to help in this situation where I've got uh, a fully incremental cost effectiveness analysis going on because there's five possible treatment interventions going on. But we can see we can pull a CAC uh, and do cost effectiveness analysis. So once you've got to this point, once you've got your mean qualities and your mean costs, it's just normal health economic analysis from this point on. Finally, the, the, the biggest step is obviously to make sure that your model is stable, uh, by which I mean, make sure that enough patients have been simulated to ensure that once you repeat the simulation over and over again for the number of patients that are, yes, that's, that's in your cohort, um, you're not getting results that are, are bouncing around. And we can see here in this example, I've just done 5,000. And we can see the rolling average here for, for the total costs and uh, qualities. They, they start stabilizing to flat line. Whereas if I'd only done 500 or so simulations from this cohort, we can still see there's a lot of variability in bouncing around here. So with this without reaching stability here, if I rerun the model later on, I could get completely different results. Um, but this is where the, the balance of computing power and the number of patients uh, to simulate comes in. So you've got to make sure you're reaching this step, but you don't want to go too far that you're going to spend 20 minutes waiting for a simulation to run when run a million patients when you could have stopped at 50,000 and taken only a couple of minutes to do it. So I think I have enough time and Howard, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going to try and switch to R now. Hopefully everyone can see the R here. Um, please shout up if you can't. So this this is just my main Joe, script. I think we still only see the PowerPoint. Oh, do you? I was worried that was yes. going to happen. Let me 
stop sharing and then I think I've got to share R itself. Yeah, I think you need to go to share a different window that you have open on your computer. Yes, now we can see R. Perfect, thank you. Um, so this, all this code is available through the GitHub repository that Howard mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and if there are any questions people have any, about any particular functions, I'm happy to go through them at the end. But just to show you a quick live demo, fingers crossed, uh, of the model here, we can see the individual steps that I've been talking about. So I've already loaded the required libraries and my model inputs, and we're just gonna simulate a thousand patients in this case. So the first step I'm gonna do is generate all my patient characteristics using all the model inputs. So if I just run that uh, uh, outpatient here, we can see I've got a list of a thousand people now, each with their own unique age, sex, baseline characteristics that can be used uh, further on in the simulation. And then Obviously you don't see all the functions that are gonna be made. They are available in these function scripts. You can then move on to actually running the simulation. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention here is that a useful thing, if you're running a very complex simulation that's gonna take a long time to run, is potentially to build in the option to save the outputs of that simulation, to save you having to run it over and over again. You can run it once, save it, and unless you need to change any of the model inputs, um, you don't need to run it again. So I'll show this afterwards if I remember, but there is the ask yes, no function in R that will pop up with a question box that will take the user's input uh, as a true or false, and you can use that to then run logic from. And then there's also other base functions such as a directory creator that will check if a particular folder or file exists uh, and then if not, create it for you. So in this case, I'm gonna click no so we don't save the outputs. You'll see the model will now start running through all those patient characteristics and it's taking each patient and running them through arm by arm for our different drugs here so we can see the outcomes. So that's it really, that's, that's the simulation complete and we can see characteristics. So I'm going to look at drug X, patient one, see what happened to them, just as an example. So we can see here, th these are the patient characteristics over time for each of the individual patients. Uh, so we've got their age being recorded, their filtration rate over time. If they're on injections, you can see that it increased, but then as soon as they stop treatment, it starts declining at a natural rate. Uh, as soon as they hit death, we stop calculating them, but we've got other things that are being tracked, adverse events, costs, so on and so on. Uh, so just to show you that, so the output simulation results, they all appear here. I've got them stratified by drug arm and all a thousand patients. They're all stored in a list so they're easily accessible. Uh, but as you can imagine, as I've been saying, a big list like that, it takes a long time to load if you're just trying to do some simple plots. So the next function here just uses some map functions from the per package just to condense those results down. So if I look at the summary now, each patient here is summarized. I've got a thousand drug X costs, uh, and it just means I can just pull out the final row uh, for each patient in that. So I can calculate the means far quicker uh, and then do all cost-effective analysis from there. And then if I just pull out the mean, we can see here that these are our mean costs and qualities uh, for lifetime for each of the drug arms there. Uh, once you've got those down, you can then just do results like I've been talking about. So you can then, again, using this DAM pack from GitHub, you can do fully incremental cost-effective analysis, turn it as a table within your model as well as pull out some CX. Uh, and then finally, uh, like I've been saying, the final step of any patient level simulation is to perform stability checks. I like to use the Plotly package to be able to turn GG plots into interactive plots. So I can hover over here and you can see how it's changing over time. If you've not used this, package before and you've always thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have interactive plots before? I highly recommend it, but we can follow those over time. 
And it also has the useful advantage of being able to zoom in to certain aspects of your plot. So we can see here that if I tip only stops the simulation after 20 or 30 people, we can still see there's a lot of variability going on. Uh, hence why we need much longer simulations going on. And the fact that only a thousand patients didn't take that too long here, there's not much comp computational power, so you would be justified in increasing the number of patients simulated vastly. Um, Howard, I'm conscious of time actually, so I'll think I'll... Joe, there are a few questions from the chat, so yep. if you want we can spend the last few minutes going through them and, um, and then maybe come back to that as well when we, when we finish the first batch of talks. Yeah, sure. Uh, quite happy to go through questions. So um, uh, if people are happy, I think the easiest way is for me to, let me just uh, put my video on, is for me to um, kind of convey the questions on behalf of the audience, um, although I think it's just easier to do it that way. So yeah. the first question which has generated some discussion was uh, why need to simulate patient characteristics instead of using actual patient data, uh, individual level data. And there was somebody uh, replying that, uh, well, it depends on whether you do have individual level data, but maybe, um, do you want to say more? Do you have any? No, that's, that, that's, that's exactly it. If, if you have the individual patient data from a particular trial, then yes, you could use, use that data to simulate your characteristics or use the characteristics of that population. Um, but if you use the distributions you gain from that individual patient data, you could say you could then be more representative of the overall general population because what you capture in a trial might not be the full range of patients you're expecting for the target intervention. Yes, which picks up nicely on another comment that came later on, which is about the sort of representativeness of the RCT in comparison to your own population. And that calls into question all sorts of different assumptions you might make, as you were saying. Mm. Um, then let me just scroll down. There's a couple of questions which are more about the specifics of, of using R. For example, there was a question about whether there's a difference in functionality in parallel computing from different operating systems. Uh, like Linux versus Windows versus um, Mac. I don't know. If uh, you... oh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, to be honest, I, I don't know. I've only ever done this on a, a Windows computer. I know there's a talk later on about parallel computing, so perhaps uh, we can all ask again later and get an answer there. Um, another couple of questions. One, uh, more of a statement, which I agree with, which is uh, checking standard errors is at least as important as checking means. With insufficient patients, standard errors are overestimated. And I think you've made your point uh, in the talk as well. Yeah, no, I, I, complete, I completely agree with that. Uh, and especially when it comes to the um, stability checks of the model as well. Yes. Um, I, I forgot to put them onto these graphs here, but yes, the one thing to check around these graphs is not only the means, but the confidence intervals as well. Um, another very good point, I think, and by the way, you will notice that I am uh, being very cautious and trying not to name anybody who's asked a question just in case issues with privacy and confidentiality came up later, but obviously everybody who's at the meeting know who's asked the questions because the name come up in the chat. So this is a bit silly, but go with it. So the other question is simulation of patients, well, again, is more of a statement. Simulation of patient profiles uses models. And then uh, that means that there's more structure than in the actual data. And this needs to be acknowledged. Um, if, if I'm following that question, is th I think, is that related to where I said you could simulate patient characteristics independently or dependently? Yes, um, I think it was in that stage, yes. Yeah, I, I, I would completely agree. In, in this example here, everything's just simulated individually um, because it's, it's a hypothetical model. But again, if you had the, this goes back to the first question, if you had the individual patient data, you could then generate sort of regression type analysis to know, understand the relationship between certain patient characteristics, which you could then feed into your simulation when you're generating these patient characteristics, and then you're keeping all those relationships that you would expect, and then you end up with a simulated cohort that should be representative of um, the target population as well. So they're all sort of interrelated in that aspect. And then I think the final question, which is a technical one, and is there a reason why the model inputs are stored in a list in R rather than the data frames with rows and each individuals? 
in terms of uh, well, uh, the, the the reason why I've stored all the outputs and all the inputs here as a list is just to try and keep things as a vector as much as possible. Just because our if if you store inputs and outputs in a data frame, each time you call a particular column or out number from that data frame, R has to try and call the entire data frame each time. Uh, so if you can store things within a vector, then it's a lot easier on R and it can call that information far quicker and speed up the simulation. Um, final question, Howard, do we have time for one final question? We could maybe move on, I think, to the next talk, but uh, I think we do want to thank Joe. A really, really nice talk and thank you so much for sharing the code. I've already tested it, it does work. Um, <laughs> So everyone can jump in there. But uh, Joe, you could reply to some of the questions in the comments uh, afterwards if you wanted. I think there are some technical questions about the code. Yeah, but I'll go through and I'll try and uh, respond to some of them where, where I spot them. Uh, and just a, a final thing, I just want to say a, a big thank you to my colleague as well, Hannah Baker, who when we were first approached to do a patient level simulation, uh, we, we worked together uh, to come up with a, quite a lot of these steps and functions together. So big thanks to her as well. Thank you. Stop sharing. There you are. Thanks, Joe. So our next speaker is Kevin Dayton from Delta Hat, who's going to tell us about propensity scores in R and how to manage multiple scenario analyses in a single clean script. So Jim, look, if we give Kevin access, he can then take over. Yes. So um, I'm trying to find Kevin. There you go. Uh, okay. Kevin, you should be able to um, talk. Unmute yourself, I've unmuted you, and then you should be able to um, share your, your, your screen as well. Yep, we can see it. Hello, so can you hear me as well, sorry? We can hear you as well, yes, Hi, Kevin. <laughs> One, wonderful, thank you. Um, I'll just try and get the, the chat window up as well. Um, just because I thought I could, I could maybe ask a couple of questions as we go. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to this. I'm, I'm, probably relatively inexperienced in R, I suppose. I've, I've been using R for about 18 months, but predictably, I, I really enjoy using it, so I'm really pleased to talk about it. Um, so for today, it's, it's about propensity scoring, so really trying to, to make comparisons to uncontrolled single arm trials. And in terms of managing multiple scenarios, this is, um, so sort of, I'll use a simplified example of, of some work that we've done and just trying to keep the script relatively clean. If people have ways of improving it, then obviously I'm, I'm very open to hearing that as well. Before we start, I know we, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of participants here today. So just as a bit of a test of the chat function and as, as a very simple survey, can I just ask with a, with a yes or no or YRN response, how many people are familiar with propensity scoring? Okay, wonderful. Great responses. Okay, fantastic. That, that's, that's come through brilliantly. Um, and then just in terms of, of pitching the R content, can, as a, if people stop answering that one, and then can I just ask if you're familiar with for loops? Do the people familiar with for loops and R? I'm just thinking we may have a, a, range, of, a range of participants. So very much yes, some no's. Okay, wonderful. All right, thanks very much. So... I'll move on with the, the presentation. So I'm going to try to do this roughly in, in two halves. So I'll go through the PowerPoint content and then move to R and, and do some coding in there. In terms of the content, this, this might look like a lot, but I'll be relatively brief through these different topics um, because I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, with most, of these, uh, most of these aspects. Okay. So randomized controlled trials, I won't patronize you. I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar. Um, the RCTs generally represent the gold standard of study design. And the idea being you take your, your sample population and then in the schematic, you, you randomize them as indicated with the dice. And then you'll take a baseline measure, provide an intervention, um, and then take a, an outcome measure. And by looking at the two different groups, you can 
So slides, can people see my slides okay? Sorry, just slides are in the video. Yeah, we should be able to see them. Okay, sorry. Um, so 